Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for these students. Uh, I pray that you would uh, bless this time that we have together. And Father, I just pray that as we walk through Esther, that we would see your hand at work, not only in miraculous ways, but um, in, even in the very sometimes mundane events of our life. Father, you are there and you are working. Uh, and we are grateful for that. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So just to give you a little bit of um, uh, to, to, to a little bit of review here, uh, I'm going to read 9 through 12 and kind of talk about what we already talked about just real briefly and then we'll move forward. Queen Vashti also gave a feast. So remember there was this big six-month party to recruit people to fight for Xer with Xerxes against the Greeks for all of the bigwigs, all of the nobles. Uh, uh, and princes of the empire. And then after that, there was this seven-day party for uh, everybody else. Uh, and then in addition to that, Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to King, yeah, they belonged to King Hathrock. That alone should just be. Um, on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was married with wine, drunk, uh, he commanded them to them, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Ab Abgatha, Abagtha, I don't know, Zithar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Hasharosh, to bring Queen Vashti before the king in, with her royal crown, in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. At this the king became enraged, and his anger burned within him. So we have this idea of King Xerxes to parade his beautiful wife uh, around for men to leer at and to whistle and hoot or whatever they did in ancient times, uh, his drunken buddies, in front of his drunken buddies. And um, for some reason, Vashti wasn't down for that. So she refused the king. And uh, uh, he, uh, he is angry. Uh, his response is to burn with anger. So here's the backdrop. The backdrop. This is what we learn about the king and his empire. It's a picture of uh, the Persian court and his king. The king is impetuous, and he has, as I told you, my nephew Jack used to say, anger issues. Um, and and uh, the Persian court is not a safe place. And yet, Vashti still refuses him. And, and this is the very court into which young Esther is about to step. So, for the first time, but not for the last, we'll see ambiguity in this passage. And this is where we're starting with this. How are we to interpret this passage? Ambiguity appears throughout the story, and this is the first of many times that the author does not tell us, he does not comment on whether what Vashti did, or Xerxes for that matter, was right or wrong. Was, was Xerxes right to uh, call his wife to be paraded around? Was that wrong? Was Vashti right to refuse or wrong? Now we may look at that and go, of course Xerxes was wrong, and of course Vashti was right, but in ancient Persia? Maybe that was normal. Uh, and, and the author doesn't tell us. Now, Xerxes may be seen in a little bit worse light because of his, we'll put it nicely, impaired judgment. Mm -hmm. um, but and at least Vashti was sober. But, but ambiguity is part of the fabric of this story. People will do what they will. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. The author doesn't tell us sometimes. But none of it towards the purpose and plan of God. And that is at the heart of Esther. So the purpose of this first porch and these first 12 verses of Esther is to paint a picture of a king who holds tremendous power yet yields it for his own glory and purposes with no regard uh, to the consequences of others. 
Uh, it's also showing us what Esther and Mordecai are up against. Because they are going, he is, she is going to, Esther is going to petition this king without being summoned. How is he going to react? And then another purpose of this portion of the story is to show us that although God may make use of human actions, his sovereignty and his providence are never dependent upon those actions. God will do what he purposes to do, regardless of what we do. And in fact, God's hand of providence for the redemption of his people is already at work through the selfish and impetuous demands of a pagan king and the refusal of his pagan wife. He can use even that for his purposes. So um, we're going to go through verses 13 through 22. I, I've entitled this, How Do You Solve a Problem Like a Vashti? That's a reference. Uh, and, and he's going to consult wise men. Wise men? That's at least debatable. Verses 13 and 14. Then the king said to the wise men who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in law and judgment. The men next to him being Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Marys, Marcina, and Memucan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who saw the king's face and sat first in the kingdom. Uh, it, it didn't mean to make a happy face or a sad face. Uh, in, the, in the quote, uh, there was a there was a poem there that had I locked the rest of it off. Um, so it, it is a sad face, but you know, it's a sad story. Um, so uh, these are wise men, sort of. Uh, at least the king thinks they are. And they're the seven men that could come into the king's presence uninvited or and unannounced. And that's important to know. Because it's important to know for this story that if you came to the king uninvited and or unannounced, he could kill you for that. If he wanted you there, he didn't kill you. But if he didn't want you there, he would kill you. And that was a very real threat. But these guys didn't have to be announced or invited into the uh, king's presence. They were experts in the law. And, and so rather than handle a personal problem with his own wife by himself, Xerxes decides instead to take legal action against her. Now, what does it mean that they understood the times? It probably means that they knew how to use astrology or divination, uh, the sun summoning of spirits to determine the best course of action. Um, and again, it's setting the stage to show us who is really in charge. And these wise men decide to enact a new law. So this is Xerxes saying to his um, uh, to his uh, people, he says, according to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti? Because she has not performed the command of King Ahasuerus delivered by the eunuchs. Then Medikin said, in the presence of the king and the officials, not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all of the peoples who are in the, king, the, uh, the provinces of the king, uh, of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt. Since they will say King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble women of Persia and Media, who have heard of the queen's behavior, will say to the, the same to their, the, all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath in plenty. If it please the king, let a royal order go out from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it may not be repealed, that Vashti has never again, uh, is never again to come before King Ahasuerus. And let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, for it is vast, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low 
a life. So it's, a, it's asked, according to the law, what is to be done? And it's more likely referring to his advisor. So, so, so um, Xerxes is essentially saying, what do you think should be done? Or what law should be written in response to this affront of Vashti? And here's what they decide. First of all, Vashti will no longer be queen. Whether that means she's simply deposed or relegated to the harem or executed, we don't know. And a better queen will be chosen. Presumably that means one who is more obedient. And then they will write an irrevocable law, a law that cannot be revoked. That's the first time, but not the last time we will hear that. And notice how Memnikin is able to manipulate the king. He flatters him. He's preying on Xerxes' fears by escalating Vashti's crime. This isn't just a crime against you, king. It's a crime against all husbands everywhere in the entire empire. Uh, as Karen, Dr. Job says this, uh, what began as an issue between two people suddenly is escalated into a crisis of empire-wide proportion. Dr. Ian DeGood puts it this way. It is clear already that the law merely serves as a fig leaf to cover the whim of the king and his advisors. Now, we also see irony here. Um, let's look at verses 21 and, and 22. This advice pleased the king and the princes, and the king did as Memekin proposed. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, all 127 of them, to every province in its own script and to every people in its own language, that every man be master in his household, own household and speak according to the language of his people. So out of fear, here's the irony, out of fear that the people might learn of the king's embarrassment, Xerxes and his advisors send out a, a decree announcing it to the whole empire, announcing his embarrassment to the whole empire. This is what Dr. Joe says. Ironically, by accepting Memnikin's advice, the king ends up publicizing his embarrassing plight in order to, uh, in, uh, by ordering throughout the empire what he himself could not accomplish in his own palace, that every man should be ruler over his own household. Afraid that all the women of the empire will hear about Vashti, he ends up assuring what he fears by sending a dispatch to every province of the empire. Um, so we have this irony, and not to mention uh, the irony of demanding respect. Respect that comes by way of command is not respect at all. Respect is earned, not demanded. I think we're also meant to he see humor in this story, too. This is a dark comedy. It's almost like some of Shakespeare's works. I, I remember reading Taming of the Shrew in my Shakespeare class in the, uh, in the cage, which was the, uh, the snack bar at St. Olaf, laughing out loud at the bar, reading Taming of the Shrew. Um, so I think it's a dark comedy. These people are fools. We can see that, but they don't realize it. They don't see it. And, and it may be... Maybe, uh, weird or, or, or seem odd to laugh at a story where the villain is bent on genocide. But I do think we're supposed to see humor in the folly and the pride of Xerxes and his buddies. In fact, one theologian said in terms of cinematic parallels, these guys are not so much the Magnificent Seven as they are Xerxes and the Seven Wars. And I, mean, I think it's true that time allows us to laugh at things that we did not find funny at all at the time. Uh, I'm sure you have stories like that. I have many stories like that. Um, one of them is this. I was in seventh grade, the fall of my seventh grade year. I, we lived in McLean three different times. This was the third of the three times. And I was there for all of sixth grade and part of seventh grade. We left in February. And I had several times in that fall, or a couple times, uh, ridden my bike to my former elementary school, Chesterbrook Elementary School, to visit my old teachers, particularly my PE teacher. And um, 
uh, my mother found out I was doing that and told me I couldn't do that anymore because it was a little bit far away, but mostly it was a very, very busy road that was narrow and had a lot of blind spots and no sidewalks. So I was riding my bike in the middle of a lot of traffic. So she told me not to do that. And of course, being 12-year-old Amy, uh, I didn't pay attention to her. So I uh, decided to take off for, um, for Chesterbrook Elementary School one day and a beautiful day in the fall. And I was wearing my new white pants. They were adorable. I, I, I don't know if you can picture this, but maybe picture a, a Civil War, not Civil War, a, a Revolutionary War uniform. They were white, but instead of a zipper or buttons, it was like this flap with four buttons on the front. It was cute as could be, right? So I go to uh, Chesterbrook, and I can't remember if it was on the way there or on the way back, but at some point during my ride, my chain fell off of my bike. And I thought, oh, I can fix this. I know how to fix my chain. So I put my chain back on, fixed it just fine. My pants, however, oh, no. did not fare very well. So I thought, hmm, I'm in trouble. Well, no, I think I can handle this. I will bleach them. So I go home, and I don't, I'm, I'm 12, right? So I don't really understand bleaching and how it works. So uh, I didn't read the instructions because I was 12 year old and actually almost 60 year old and would do that too, but that's a story for another day. So I don't read the instructions. I just dump a bunch of bleach into the slop sink and throw my pants in and think I'll come back later and get them out and dry them off and we'll be fine. I didn't realize you were supposed to dilute the bleach. You were supposed to put like a cup of bleach or a half a cup of bleach in a big, you know, sink. So I go to pick up my pants, and boy, does it smell in there, too. And they're in pieces. Threads, the, the, the thread has evaporated. It's gone. And I've got, the little, I've got the little, it's disintegrated. I've got the little front flap. I've got part of one leg. I've got part of another leg. This I cannot fix. And my mother was so mad at me. Because obviously I had to tell her the whole story. And it was not funny for a long time. Now it's hilarious, right? So, um, sorry, mommy. I'm lying yet again. So uh, we can we can see in this story comedy. Even in this serious story, even in the difficult things that happen in it. So here's our conclusion. Here's what I want you to remember from this first chapter. <clears throat> God is at work. All the time. When we think about redemptive history, we tend to think of the great miracles, the parting of the Red Sea, fire from heaven, the resurrection of Jesus. But Dr. Jobes points out that these miracles are linked together by long years, decades, centuries of seemingly insignificant, ordinary, everyday events. Dr. Jobes further points out that we now live in one of those times, between the ascension and the return of Jesus, where it's almost all normal events and, and few miracles. As this, I heard commentators. Like Xerxes long ago, modern kings, presidents, and rulers make decisions from purely political motives. Like Vashti, people today unwittingly make decisions that have long-reaching consequences far beyond what they could have foreseen. These events may be completely secular and perhaps made by people who give Christ no thought. Nonetheless, through them, God is moving all of history forward to accomplish all that must happen before the return of his son, Jesus Christ, the true king of kings. We can take comfort in that. We can take comfort in the fact that God is in control. Quote Dr. Joseph. Alone. Name whichever empire, nation, or government you wish is the mightiest, the greatest, the most powerful. The king of the universe sits high above on his throne, laughing at the impotence of even the greatest of nations. 
Through invisible and inscrutable means, God continues to move all of history to fulfill his covenant in Jesus Christ. He alone truly is the king of kings. The one who opposes Christ, uh, the king opposes God. So because of this, the story of Esther serves as a warning to all those who would oppose God, for they will fail. They may have power and wealth in this life, but they will ultimately be destroyed. At the same time, the Esther story serves as a source of hope and comfort uh, to God's people, to, for God's people. As, doc, as Dr. Jobes puts it, to be in Christ is to be on the winning side of history, to be victorious, even in the face of life's greatest threats. So the Esther story not only tells us that God will never abandon his people, it also tells us that God will accomplish his redemptive plan no matter what. God is good. All the time. God is good. Amen. Amen. Um, okay, that's it for uh, well, that's it for the lecture. Uh, I do have uh, the next set of questions for you. You can work on them for the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, you do not have to do them for homework. I will give you time tomorrow to work on them. I'm going to turn this off right now.